When I was in high school, uh, I had a friend who asked me one time, said, uh, would you like to join me? There's a church across town that's doing this thing. And uh, it was about this time of year. And I said, sure, why not? Sounds like fun. And uh, it was a church's version of a haunted house, and it was called the Hereafter House. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming by your reaction that I am not the only one that has experienced this. For those who missed out on this, let me just tell you, uh, you were greeted as you went into this with various scenes of death and destruction. So the first scene may be this tragic car accident with bodies strewn everywhere. The implication was it was some foolish teenager back in my day that was drinking and driving. Now I understand when they do it. It's texting and driving, and they show these graphic scenes. And it's not just scenes, because as you walk in, you're given the impression that these young children were less than holy. And so because of this, the demons are coming now, and they're grabbing their souls and taking them and rushing them, ushering them right into hell. And you walk through several scenes. Another scene that you might walk through was the young girl who has gotten pregnant and has walked into the abortion clinic. And because we know that that immediately causes no love from God and damns you to hell forever. I'm just kidding. There's forgiveness. But this is the scene depicted that uh, the demons then come and usher this girl from a botched abortion who's died on the table and all this. And then you are finally ushered into this room. It's very hot. The heat is on. And you see these, these people, and they're being tormented, and demons that are very frightening are running around, and they're tormenting these people, and it's horrible. There are screams, and there are, you know, the most horrible things you can think of. Please don't, don't hurt me. I'm sorry. I wish I had, you know, whatever. And then, finally, at the end of this tour, after you've been subjected to all this, you get to a place where you enter a room where the air conditioning is on. And it is all white. I mean, like, everything is draped in white fabric. And there is a loud worship song playing. uh, And you see a throne, and on that throne is an individual. Now, depending on the church, you know, sometimes you see the face. Sometimes you just see the silhouette. But you know that at this this point, you are in heaven. And then they usher you into this final room, and they say, So now, where do you want to go? Not much of a question, right? I mean, are you an idiot? (laughs) You know, as as I was talking with the staff this week, Pastor Ryan shared that his church growing up did a variation of this. They did a stage play that was known as Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. So instead of going through rooms, it's just all acted out right in front of you there. And amazingly enough, on Facebook, a friend of mine uh, this past week linked to a thing called the Judgment Journey where you can walk through the woods of Georgia and through this post-apocalyptic scene where there are like airplanes crashing and fire and burning and people screaming and all this. You see all this chaos and destruction. Um, And as I was thinking about this this week and I was watching videos, I actually ran across a news report from just a few years ago describing the Hereafter House. And I thought I'd show you just a little bit of this news article. Here you go. This ministry is set up so that people can come through and we present the gospel, but we do we, we present the gospel, but we're not trying to scare anybody um, into eternity. Holland Chapel works for months every year to make this happen. Members of the church are the actors and they all work to set up and take down the rooms in the house. Our goal is for lost, lost lives to come to know Jesus Christ. They say it's all worth it if it makes a difference in people's lives. You know, this woman uses some words that I don't believe at all. We're not trying to scare people. Okay, you saw the images. But she uses some words that we are very familiar with in Christianity and in church, and and even people outside the church know we use these words. Things like the word gospel. Uh, Eternity is one. Uh, Lost people was something she used. You know, and I get it. It was kind of humor. She said the goal was not to scare people, but to get to know, get people to know Jesus. You know, she doesn't use the word, but she really is talking about maybe an expression that some of us grew up with, which was this idea of you need to get saved. There you go. I heard it out there. We have other ways to describe it. Being born again, asking Jesus into your heart, praying the sinner's prayer, getting your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you, Amy, for that one. Uh, Soul winning. Anybody remember that one? Or, Or, you know, that's just following Jesus. You know, no matter how we describe it, There is something to say that there is an aspect of our faith that that 
that takes place that we want, we desire for people to follow Jesus. But somewhere along the way, we took this idea of following Jesus and we changed it. We converted it a little bit into more of a contractual agreement where I do something and Jesus or God responds and therefore I'm okay and nothing else has to matter. And, and I think Baptists are especially problematic here because we've reduced it to this sinner's prayer. And it's like, if you just do this one thing, you can know you can be right with God. And so we throw around words like salvation and gospel. And what I want us to look at today is what do these words mean? And really specifically, this idea that if you pray this prayer and you accept Jesus into your heart, you are right with God. That's what I want us to look at today. So we're still in this series called You've Been Lied To, and my name is Brent, by the way, and we're going to look today at how the church has defined salvation. How has the church defined this? And, and, and to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of that word much anymore, probably because of the baggage that comes with it, but, I, but following Jesus, we want people to be made right with God. We want people to know God and to understand him and to live in relationship with Jesus. So how do we make that happen? And is what we've been taught or maybe even some of the ways we've done it, guilty, is it the best way to make this happen? So that's our lie today is it's pray this prayer and accept Jesus into your heart and you'll be right with God. Now I realize me saying that some of you may be ready to get up and walk out. Stay with me. Stay with me. Um, I realize it sounds very heretical for me to make this statement, but this is a very important topic. And unfortunately, I think we've reduced it and we've narrowed it so much that we've created some problems in, in how we share the gospel, how we live the gospel, and what we expect from people who follow Jesus. So that's what I want us to look at today. So let's, like we do every week, where does this come from? Does this have a biblical basis? And I think you can actually go and make a case in the Bible. Uh, there are a few verses, but one we look at right here is just Romans 10, 9 through 13. Uh, if you've ever grown up in church, you may be familiar with what's called the Roman road to salvation. It's where you pull out these nice verses in Romans to lead people to faith. This is part of that. And listen to what the Apostle Paul says as he writes this. He says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, just looking at that passage, seems pretty clear, right? Say a few words, Jesus takes over, and we're all good. But is that exactly what Paul is talking about here? That if you just say that, those words and believe it, you're saved. You see, the Greek word here for salvation is actually the word sozo, and it actually is an interesting word to me because it has a physical and a spiritual sense. Because if you look in the Gospels, you understand that to save doesn't just talk about eternity and salvation in your soul, that it's even used as Jesus healed people, because that word means to heal, to make whole, or to rescue. And so it can have both a physical meaning and also a spiritual meaning, which does mean we are spiritually saved. But then what are we saved from? What are we saved for? What does that mean that we are saved? We throw that word around sometimes and we don't really, I think, fully grasp what it means. Because if we go to things like the judgment journey and the hereafter house, we get the impression that we're saved only from the torment and hell for eternity. But is there more to it than that? Is there more that this gospel, that this message means that we need to be paying attention, attention to? You see, if you study the context, and remember context is important, we don't ever want to build theology outside of the context. When Paul is talking here to this group of Gentiles in Rome, what he's trying to do, he's trying to point out a difference for them. He's trying to say to them, look, you guys are still trying to be made right with God by what you do, by the way you live. And specifically, you know the law. You've heard of the Ten Commandments. You know the Jewish rules and regulations. And you are still trying to live and be right with God this way. And Paul is saying, look, there is a new way. There is something different now that is how we are made right with God. And it has to do 
with Jesus, and he's wanting them to say, look, don't just focus on the law. It's time to put our focus on Jesus. And he makes the statement. He says it's not always about, it's not about doing the right things because, again, Paul makes many statements about being saved or being right with God. And repeatedly we understand that works, the things we do, have nothing to do with it. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. We know that there's not an action that we do to come to faith, but then how do we get faith? And then if we need faith and we want others to have faith, how do we make that happen? Can we make that happen? And does it matter what we do in order to make that happen? And see, and the key word here is faith, because that's the, the, the pivotal word. Is it just a prayer? Is that what creates faith, or is faith something more? You know, we could try to make the case through this that just getting people to pray a prayer is all that is needed to get right with God. And I think there are people that believe that. As I was studying this week, I discovered there's actually a thing called free grace versus lordship salvation. Go look it up on YouTube. There's lots of debates out there. Is there something more that's necessary? Not that we necessarily do, but is it just a matter of saying a few words and that's it and we don't have to worry about anything else forever? I would contend that that theology, that mindset, creates a lot of problems. And we're going to look at several problems because I think it, they're numerous in how that shapes what we do, how we interact with each other. So, for example, if we believe that the, the only requirement to help people get right with God is for them to say a prayer then what we do to get them to that point really doesn't matter, right? Whatever means is necessary becomes acceptable. In fact, that's kind of what we've seen played out many different times. Why else would you put on a hereafter house and show these graphic scenes and demons torturing if you didn't believe that I'm going to scare the hell out of you? Literally, right? I mean, I grew up in a time where, you know, we had the traveling evangelist. And that evangelist would come around. I should have put a hanky in my pocket. That would have been very appropriate for the... Tra I'd, I'd need about 80 more pounds, too, to be the real traveling evangelist. But to, we, growing up, we had these guys come into our churches, and they would come, and they would preach these messages, and they were messages of salvation. And they would get to the end, and they'd get all fired up, and they'd be all sweaty, and they'd be saying things like, Now, let me tell you, brothers and sisters... That today is the day of salvation. And if you walk out of this room today and you get in that car and you drive home, what happens to you, brothers and sisters, if your car is in an accident and you die and you go to hell? See, I've experienced this a few times. Well, when you hear things like that, what do you think? Does anybody here really want to sign up to go to hell? Really? Surprising. So if we make it in this very black and white, just Come forward. What's going to happen? The aisles are going to be flooded and people are going to say, I don't want to experience that. And we get them down here and we convince them if you say these magic words, sprinkle the fairy dust on top, then it all is taken care of. And unfortunately, it justifies us to say, look, did you see how many thousands came to Jesus today? But the studies show that like in 10 years, 9 out of 10 people that respond in any type of this situation, it says there is no visible life change. There's no commitment to faith. There's no following of Jesus Christ that's happening. So the means, the ends don't necessarily justify the means. You know, I also grew up in the era where we did cold calling evangelism. You know what? We'd get random names. We'd get the name from the water department that... You know, the Carters just moved into the neighborhood, and on Tuesday night, we'd get a couple of guys, and we'd go out, and we'd be ready, and we'd knock on that door and interrupt their dinner, and we didn't think twice about it, because we had a very important message to tell them. They needed to sit down and listen, because what we had to do was more important than the food they were eating. And we would start with two questions. Do you know for sure that you're going to be with God in heaven, and if God were to say, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Well, those aren't challenging, tense, building questions, are they? I mean, those are like, oh, pretty easy. You know, immediately we justify our behavior to say, well, my end result is to get people to say a prayer that saves them, and that's all that matters. So how we get them there is irrelevant. 
this method and others, are, are, as we've talked about, we're just trying to scare people. And if our goal is to just get the people to say those words, whatever we do becomes access, uh, acceptable. But as I thought about that, I thought about really what are we communicating? If our best tactic to encourage somebody to follow Jesus is fear, what does that say about our faith? What does that say about Jesus? If the best we can hope for is for me to stand up here and scare you to death, I just don't know if that's a Jesus really worth following. If all we have is fear. But that's what this communicates. There's another problem too. Because I think the second problem we run into is that when we believe this idea that just pray this prayer theology, it kind of leads to a, a focus exclusively on the future. It kind of, for some reason, we never talk about what Jesus does for us now. It's pray this prayer so that you don't go to hell when you die. It focuses completely on the future with no impact on how Jesus could impact your life today. It's all about going to heaven when you die. And we begin, we reduce the gospel, we reduce salvation to nothing more than a get out of hell free card. Because that's what we're looking for. And I can live however I want, I can do whatever I want, as long as I have said those words. In fact, as I was studying this week, I was listening to various things, and I heard a pastor was talking about an interaction with a guy. And this guy was talking about just his terrible lifestyle. He was mistreating women and using women for his own pleasure, and he was getting drunk all the time, and he just, you know, was doing whatever he wanted to do. And he asked the guy, he said, well, what are you doing? And the guy was like, well, I'm a pastor. And the guy's like, oh, well, that's all right. I'm a brother, too. You know, and he's like, well, explain that to me. What do you mean? He said, well, you know, when I was seven, I said a prayer, and that's all that matters. So I'm going to heaven. But I think when we believe this pray a prayer theology, it sets us up for that. Don't focus on the here and now. Only focus about what will happen then and there when I'm dead. And again, I ask the question, if that's truly all we're concerned about, why would anybody follow Jesus today? If Jesus is of no value to me right now, why worry about it? Just hope you don't get hit in a car accident. And if you do, have five seconds long enough to just breathe that magic prayer and be done. There's got to be something more about Jesus that's beyond just eternity. Another problem I see here is this one. It goes right along with the, the last one. When we believe this, pray this prayer theology, all it does is it reduces the gospel down to decisions and not discipleship. It says all that's important is getting you to, make, to, to check that box. Yes, I'm in. Philosopher and author Dallas Willard wrote this. He says, people have been told they're Christians because they've confessed they believe that Jesus died for the sin, but the total package is presented in such a way that it leaves the general life untouched. We've reduced the gospel. We've reduced salvation down to are you in or are you out, and that's all we focus on. But we still have to live. Does Jesus affect how you live each and every day? I don't know if you're under, you realize this or not, but when the Bible talks about salvation, it actually uses it in three tenses, past, present, and future. Were you aware of this? See, I think many times we, when we have this pray this prayer theology, we think, oh, I was saved and that's a done deal, so we move on. But really the way the Bible talks about it, it says I, what, I, I was saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. And we see scriptural support for all these. In fact, Ephesians 2, 5, it says, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive when Christ, uh, with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by, saved, uh, by grace you have been saved. So there is a point in time in the past where we have been saved, where we are beginning to follow Jesus. But then it's something about every day that comes into play because 1 Corinthians 1, 18 tells us, it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. And it's not talking about those outside the faith coming in. It's meaning all of us who know Jesus. It's a continual daily thing. I mean, I don't know. Am I the only one? I kind of need that salvation every day. It's something that can't be a one and done event for me. I need it ongoing every day in my life. And then we do look forward to that day when the ultimate salvation will come. Romans 5.10, where we read, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved 
through his life. There's a salvation to come, and that's the eternity part. But don't miss the past and the present that exist in that salvation with Jesus. It's not a one-and-done event that happened to me years ago. It's something that continues to happen to me every day, and it's part of what the gospel means. It means I'm being recreated. I'm being made new each and every day. I'm a new creature, a new creation in Christ. What's another problem with this approach is this here. It reduces the gospel, salvation, to a very narrow, one-size-fits-all approach to following Jesus. Christians are really good at finding a good idea, packaging it up, putting it online, selling it, and convincing everybody this is the one and only way this should ever take place. Don't believe me? Go back and look in the 90s at the evangelism explosion. That's the two questions I quoted earlier. We want a package. We want a prepackaged approach that says one size fits all. Everybody needs the same answer. Everybody needs the same solution. Let's figure it out and let's do it. But this misses the point of humanity, doesn't it? Doesn't it miss the fact that you and I are very different? We all have different journeys. We all have been on different paths. And let me tell you, it begins and ends with Jesus, but how we end up there is going to be very different. I listen to some of your stories when we get to talk about how you came to faith, and I can guarantee you, I've never heard one exactly like mine yet. And if I haven't heard one exactly like mine, what makes me think that what led me to Christ will lead somebody else to Christ? You know, the problem is this, the one-size-fits-all approach takes out the aspect that we're all human, but it looks for the easy answer. Let me get a program in my mind. Let me get two questions to ask. And then what it also does is it reduces the person we're talking to from a human to a project. Let me save you. And then what do we typically do after we get to that point of salvation? Awesome. Good to see you. Do you realize that it was never meant to be this way? It was never meant to be a one-size-fits-all. Let me walk you down the path that I've been and get you to a decision point and then walk away. It's always been about relationship. It's always been about welcoming new people into the community of faith. Amy's going to talk about this next week, that you can't do faith all by yourself. But we've treated that moment of salvation to be, yep, you just do it and then you're on your own. And it doesn't work that way. Our different experiences create different needs and different journeys that begin and end with Jesus, but one size never fits all. Another issue is this. Do you realize that the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible? Look it up. It's not there. Could have been said, just not recorded. The biggest problem I see with this, though, is that we take something incredible. We take the gospel. We take the story of Jesus and we reduce it down to something very, very narrow. And we really lose the magnificence of the story when all we want to focus on is the cross and you believing in the cross, and that's it. This gospel is bigger than that. It's much bigger than that. And we need to expand our definition. What is the gospel then? Is it a a decision point, or is it more? You know, if you look in, there's a few places, the the word gospel in the New Testament is used over a hundred times. One place it's used is in Mark chapter one. It's when Jesus himself uses it. And he's beginning his ministry. And it says this, it says, after John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news or the gospel of God. And these are Jesus's words. He says, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Think about this. This is Jesus beginning his ministry, the words of Mark, most likely the recollection of Peter, highlighting how Jesus began his ministry. What do you see in what Jesus said? And more importantly, what do you not see? Does Jesus say, turn and follow me or go to hell? Does Jesus say, pray a prayer and come with me? He says, repent and believe the good news. So there is a believe in there and there's a repent. But the reason for that is what? The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is near. 
You see, it's over a hundred times in the gospel, in the New Testament, and the word, the Greek word is uh, euangelion, which is a compound word, which means good and news, to proclaim news that is good. And that is what Jesus is doing. And Mark, uh, we see it used that way in Mark, but there's a problem because when we think about the good news of Jesus, we think about it just of him on the cross. Jesus died for your sin, and that's so limiting because that's not even what Jesus said. Jesus doesn't even say, look, repent and believe because I'm going to die on the cross for your sin. He says the kingdom of God is near. What does that mean? You see, sometimes I think in trying to short circuit the process, we try to narrow this down too much. Mm -hmm. And we want to forget that there's a wider story that is so important. You know, we can't just pick up the Bible at Matthew and assume that's the story we're to tell because the story begins back all the way in Genesis. And if somebody were to ask you and say, how do I follow Jesus? How do I become a Christian? Don't jump to the cross. Go back to the beginning. In the beginning, there was a God who loved you, who still loves you. He created you in his image, who created humanity with intrinsic value and purpose, who loved us and desired relationship with us. And he created this beautiful earth, this beautiful world for us to enjoy and to care for and to enjoy with him and to be a part of in relationship with him. But see, we messed it up. Humanity messed it up. God, in his desire, though, not to have robots who just automatically chose him, he gave us the ability to choose to love him or to not love him. And unfortunately, through Adam and Eve, as we are representatives there in the garden, they chose to not follow God. They wanted their own way. And that messed up God's plan. They didn't, it wasn't enough to enjoy God's company. They wanted to be like God, so they rebelled. But God was undeterred. He was unrelenting in his passion for humanity. And he put into place, put into motion a plan to restore and reconcile us. And it began with a man named Abraham. Did you think the gospel had anything to do with Abraham? It absolutely does. Because it's God's selection of this one man. And he says, look, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. But it's not just for your own benefit. I'm not just going to bless you so that you have riches and you have wealth and you have everything you want. I'm blessing you so that other nations in the world will know me and know that I am the one true God. But as humanity often does, they continued to push away from God. And God himself was never enough. So after years of rebelling, they were eventually taken into captivity, the Israelites. And they, after years of captivity and bondage, they heard promises of a coming Messiah. And then one day, Jesus enters the scene. Jesus comes on the scene, born of the Virgin Mary in the lineage of David, tying him back to the kings of old. He grows up, he's baptized by John. And he begins his work, and he spends three years among the people, calling people to follow his way, healing people of sickness and disease, calling out religious leaders for their hypocrisy and legalism, for adhering to religious laws with no change of heart. He showed compassion to the people, and he was God in flesh who lived among us, and to replace the images of God that the people had had. And he said, look, this is what God is like. I am God living in front of you now. He was arrested. He was unjustly accused. He was convicted. He was crucified and buried. And his death paid the price for our sin and gives us the opportunity to be made right with God. But after three days, he rose from the grave. And the same power that rose him physically from the grave is the same power that is being offered to you and to me to bring to us new life, to make us completely new creations in him, to be freed from sin, forgiven for all that we've done, empowered to live victorious lives and adopted as children of God. And for 40 days, Jesus walked on this earth. His resurrec- after his resurrection, he appeared to people. They saw him and he continued to teach. And he told those his, that were following him to take his message to the world. He ascended into heaven, leaving his followers behind to take this gospel, this good news, this incredible story to all nations. And Jesus is not uninvolved now. He's still involved interceding as we live as citizens of his new kingdom. And we await the day when he will return to set right all that is wrong, when he restores creation to a place where we live in his presence forever and there is no pain and there is no sorrow anymore. 
You see, that's the gospel. That's the abbreviated gospel. But it's the entire story of God and his love for us and his desire to live in relationship with us. And it's not just about what happens one day in the future. It ha- it's about what can happen to you here and now today and how you can live in relationship with Jesus. You see, I think we take this salvation message and we want to narrow it down to a contract that says, okay, let me sign on the line. Let me get what I need from you and then I'll go do my own thing. And we begin to look for the loopholes in the contract to say, let me live however I want. And Jesus said, I didn't come to give you a contract. It's not just that you are justified by what I've done on the cross. I bring you new life. I'm here to give you a covenant not a contract, a covenant to be apart together. That's what the gospel is. You see, we try to reduce this. We try to make it simple. And I get it. I understand that we want to be able to talk to people about Jesus. But in doing so and reducing it to a just pray this prayer moment, it really takes you and me out of the equation. And Jesus, from the beginning, his intention was never to take us out of the equation, but to use us in his plan to take that story to the world. And you know who can tell your story your way? Only you. Only you. And God can use that with you stuttering and stammering and embarrassed and nervous, just like we all would be when we sometimes talk to people about Jesus. And God can use that in powerful ways. It's not about learning the right presentation. It's about knowing the right person, and that person is Jesus Christ. You see, when you read the Bible and you begin to look at how people interacted, you see that Jesus' message actually changed with different people. You know, in the Bible, in the New Testament, we see two different stories that Jesus interacts with rich people, rich guys. One guy comes to him and he says, what must I do to have eternal life? You see, he's focused on the end. He's not really focused on the now, but he wants to make sure he's safe when it all comes to an end. And Jesus tells the guy, he says, you know what? Sell everything, or excuse me, he says, you know, live by the commandments. Love God, love other people. And the guy goes, oh, okay, great, I do that. Is there anything else? And Jesus says, well, you know, there is one more thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And the Bible tells us, he says, that man went away sad because he had great wealth. Does that mean Jesus is expecting all of us to sell everything we have? No, what Jesus is saying, he says, look, if you're going to follow me, if that salvation is going to mean anything, it means there's nothing in your life that comes before me. Not your wealth, not your family, not your job, not your success, not your fame, not anything in this world can come before him. You see, there's another story also where Jesus interacts with a rich guy. And this guy was clamoring to see Jesus. He's doing anything and everything he can. In fact, he even climbed up in a tree to see Jesus walk by. Jesus catches his attention. He says, get down here. I'm coming to your house. As he interacts with Jesus, the story jumps and it just says, and Zacchaeus took everything. He was a a crooked tax collector. And it said he, in that moment of interaction with Jesus, he says, I'm giving back all that I've cheated people from. I'm giving it back. And Jesus says, after he makes this declaration, aha, today salvation has come to this house. You see, the difference is just this. It's how do we interact with an encounter with Jesus? How do we respond when we encounter Jesus? You see, there's this guy and all he's concerned about with is eternity. And there's another guy that says, look, I know I need Jesus today. And that's the question I think we have to ask. Are, are, are we following Jesus for the future? Or are we following Jesus today? You see, I think one of the greatest heresies that we, we have in the world today, it's the idea that believing certain things about the Bible is all that is necessary. To believe goes beyond just mental assent. You realize in the book of James, it says even the demons believe and they're scared. Believing is not enough. It's a belief. It's a trust that says I'm going to change something. Something is going to happen within me because of my encounter with Jesus. I won't continue to live the way I have. I won't continue to live the way I've done because Jesus, I've been in his presence. And I'm not saying you change because of it. I'm I'm saying it, it changes you, period. And it's not something we can fake. 
You see, sometimes I wonder, as Christians, if we're far too worried about making sure people are believers rather than their followers. And there's a big difference. I was on Twitter last night. I watched Twitter way too much. And I saw a church's tagline that says, we are a local group of saved, baptized believers. And I thought, hmm, sounds good. But I'm not calling you to believe. I want you to believe. But we're calling you to follow. We're calling you to follow. Because when Jesus is there, he says, look, just come with me. Jesus doesn't say, well, let me drop some little power on you and save you and you're done. No, it's about a daily life, walking, living in relationship with the one who gave his life for you and rose from the grave so you could experience new life. I do believe there's a problem with the pray this prayer theology. And you see all my reasons for why I think it's, it's problematic. I think we've got to be people that don't worry about if people are saved, but we worry about are people following Jesus. We can ask a lot of questions about salvation. Well, this person did this, are they saved? I don't know. It's not up to me. Praise God, and you should praise God, that Brent is not responsible. I don't get to decide who's in and who's out. Amen. Neither do you. But we can call people to follow. We can call people to a relationship with a real individual who is alive today, who loves us so much that we can't even begin to comprehend just how much he loves us. Maybe you're here today, and you hear this message, and you hear the gospel story, and you know that message is for you. I'm not asking you to make a decision. What I'm asking you is if you'll take a step, a first step of many steps in following Jesus. Amy described her journey of faith this week. She said it's a series of a lot of yeses to Jesus. And today I'm just saying, will you make that first yes? It's not the only one, it's just the beginning. And for some of you, if you're following Jesus, I'm asking you to change your heart, change your mind about how we view helping people come to understand Jesus. I'm not asking you to learn a presentation. I'm asking you just to be real. The neighbors, the coworkers, when they look at you and they see you living as a citizen of the kingdom of God, is that enough to motivate them to say, what's different about you? And you can say, well, it's Jesus and let me tell you about him. It's not a pray this prayer moment. It may be months and months. I heard a missionary one time give a presentation. He said he went to, I think it was Papua New Guinea. He talked about how when they went into this village, this very remote village, they had to learn the language, they had to learn the customs. And once they learned the language, they went in and they began to teach them the gospel. Do you realize this individual, it said nine months, they presented the message, starting with Genesis all the way through nine months to get them to a place where they were just then ready to hear about Jesus. How many times do we short circuit that and just jump right there forgetting that there's a story here? And it's an incredible story about a God who loves us so much. We don't want to short circuit that. We want to help people not make a decision, but become a disciple of Jesus.